So in light of today's message, which I've entitled Contentment with What God Provides, I was thinking about the financial lessons that I've learned, you know, over, over my lifespan and, you know, how they have, you know, been life-changing and, and insightful, you know, and, and I was... I was a master at making mistakes financially. I really was. I, I blew it so many times. But the good news is, you know, God teaches us through those things. And we correct them and we change. And we handle things different, handle our finances differently. And there's always the hope that we would uh, share that with our children and they would listen to our advice and, you know, they wouldn't go through those same mistakes. My experience is that probably is not going to happen, though. They just, for some reason, God insists on teaching them their own lessons. And so one of the major lessons that I've had to learn is that, you know, having, having enough money or in the sense of, you know, what we're talking about today in the sense of being wealthy or, and having stuff, you know, it does not bring the joy and peace that God wants for my life or for your life. You know, in many cases, it's always the opposite. Ron Blue is a Christian financial consultant. He, he's written many books on the subject. Now, I want to share with you four significant things that I've learned from Ron that, that are good reminders as we talk about the wealthy today. So let me pass them on to you. First is God owns it all. As the owner, God has all the rights. And as a manager, we have certain responsibilities and there will be rewards for handling it well, but God owns it all. Second, we are in a growth process. Money is only a tool to help us assume greater responsibilities. Third, the amount is not important. Faithfulness with what you have is what is important. And that brings us to the fourth. Faith requires action. Ron illustrates the point with the wicked slave in Matthew 25, who knew, you know, he knew what to do. He just didn't do it. You see, faith requires action. Now, back in James' day, Rome was the government of the wealthy. These elite, and I might add very corrupt, Roman leaders controlled lawyers like pawns and often caused Christians to be persecuted. Like the individuals mentioned in James chapter 4, verse 13, you know, these people planned as if there were no God. This oppressive, wealthy class spent funds as if there were no God whatsoever. And so the concept of God's, that God owns it all was completely foreign to them. Now, with those thoughts in mind, I want you to turn with me to James chapter 5. And listen carefully as we read through verses 1 through 6. And then when we're finished reading through 1 through 6 in chapter 5, I want you to turn back words a little bit, to 1 Timothy chapter 6, because we're also going to read a few verses in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So let us start with James 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their 
Rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is the last days that you have stored up your treasures. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which have been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of, of the Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Okay, now turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is where we will read verses 8, 9, and 10, followed by 17 through 19. 1 Timothy 6, verse 8. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and may many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil and, this, and say, some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Verse 17, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your word and for your instruction. We thank you for your love for us. Lord, we adore you. We invite you to invade our lives and, and to take full control for these next few minutes so that we do not miss what you are saying to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so we would begin by seeing the very first verse begins with, come now, you rich. So I'd like to address this particular passage to all of you this morning who are rich. So now that I've done that, you know, uh, all the rest of us can um, pay attention to what's being said. I, I think James had in mind the same type of men who gathered for an historic meeting who gathered back in 1923 at the Edgewater Beach Hotel in Chicago. I'd like to give you half of the account and give you the other half at the end of the message. The meeting was probably one of, if not the most significant financial meetings in the history of America. Gathered there were men who were multimillionaires, who if so disposed could have controlled the media, the utilities, the pulse of the nation. These were men who gathered for consultation. The president of a large steel company, the president of the National City Bank of New York, the president of a large utility company, the president of the largest gas company in the world, a famous and successful wheat speculator, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, a member of the president's cabinet, a great leader on Wall Street in New York, 
the head of the world's largest industrial and land monopoly combined, and the president of the Bank of International Settlements. These 10 brilliant and internationally successful men came together to give thought toward their future and toward a recapping of their past. Their lives have been surrounded and blessed, we would call it that, with success. They, they were in the estimation of the rest of the world at the zenith of their careers. Perhaps these were the kind of men that James has in mind when he says, come now, you rich. A person who was a student of history and biography went to the trouble of tracing the lives of these 10 men. And as they came to the surface 25 years later, between 1923 and 1948, what had become of these men in the passing of that brief period of time. I'll share that with you as we close the message this morning. I believe that you will find it kind of interesting. James says, you who are rich, let me have your attention. The context of this passage is not difficult to discover. If you go back to the 13th verse of the previous chapter, you'll see the, that he addresses those who plan without God. You know, we discussed this pretty thoroughly last week, but let me remind you of it. James 4, 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. The passage reads as though these men, not named at, for us in this chapter, set their sight toward the future with no plan of God in mind. They lived as though they did not even, that he did not even exist. And they planned that way. That the, that's, that's the same type of person that James has in mind in verse 1 of chapter 5 where he says, come now, you rich. The Living Bible renders it like this. Look here. You, you say, tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we're going to a certain town. And, and it continues in the next verse. Now listen, you who say, or you who are rich. You see, here in the fifth chapter, these are people who spent as if there were no God. Just as those in the fourth chapter planned as if there was no God. Now, you might think just because you're not blessed with the world's goods that this passage is irrelevant. That it that really doesn't have a message for today. Well, that's not true. It is by no means outdated. You know, Fortune 500 magazine reveals in its May issue every year. It's Fortune, Fortune 500, which is the pulse of the top 500 most financially successful companies in the world. In that magazine, if you happen to take it, you'll notice that they never seem to run out of zeros when listening to people's salaries, listing people's salaries at, at the end of the, their names. The money just continues to flow. Now, I want to classify and clarify something. It is not true that the poor go to heaven and the rich go to hell. Sometimes we think that, but there are some godless poor people and there are some godly rich people in this world and there always have been and there always will be. Which brings me to this classification of people economically. First, there are those who are 
poor without and poor within. The multiplied million who go to bed starving every night would be in that group for the most part. Poor without having little or having little of this world's goods, knowing nothing of Jesus Christ, knowing nothing of the Father's love, or having or having known it, you know, re- rejecting it. Perhaps all the people, you know, the most, these people are most to be pitied. Second, there's those rich without and rich within. I know what you're thinking. You know, they, they've got it made. Well, there, there are those in Scripture who did have it made economically and spiritually. Abraham would be one of those. Joseph was another. Daniel certainly was another. Job. Jo- Joseph of Arimathea. And apparent, he was apparently rich, and so was Barnabas. You know, he was rich. He had plenty of land. He had enough to give and to give abundantly. Rich without, rich within. Now, you can anticipate what the next two are, I'm sure. Third, there are those who are poor without, but rich within. You think, hey, that's probably me. That, that's the classification that I've fallen into. I'm rich within because I've been born again. The richness of Christ has been credited to my account. I'm secure in him, but I have very little of this world's goods. And I'd say in just a moment, we really know very little about being poor. You know, we're really not poor. Without, without our within, this is a time to remember that you cannot remember the last time that you were significantly hungry and could do nothing about it. We are beautifully clothed, carefully cleansed, And we have dwellings to protect us from the elements. I actually once heard a statistic, not positive of how true it is, but I always thought it was interesting. It said, if you have change in your pocket, you are in the top 10% most wealthy people in the world. We are blessed. But in the sense of the wealthy, we are poor while being rich within. And the fourth classification, which is the group that James is addressing, those that are rich without but poor within. It has been my observation for you know, the number of years that I've been around that among the wealthy, The majority care nothing about Jesus Christ. The reason for that is explained by Timothy, and and we'll deal with that in the last part of the message. But now, in the days of James, the rich plutocrats ruled the world. That term plutocrat might be new to you. It was to me. it, It means a person whose power is derived from their wealth. These plutocrats reigned supreme in Rome. They handled the lawyers like a pawn on a chessboard. And when they pointed thumbs down, you had no possible future. They were the oppressors of the day. And so it is the oppressive, the unbelieving rich that James says, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. This is a general word for rebuke, and James levels it against the unbelieving rich man. And he tells us why he does so in this passage. And after this general rebuke, 
he turns to some specific reasons for that rebuke. Before we look at the four of them in this passage, let me say that the words weep and howl could be paraphrased shriek. That's what the original text conveys. It is a word of misery that cannot be contained. It must be exploded through the lips. Shriek is the best word. You that are rich, if you can see your misery and account for it right now, you would shriek. And now the reasons he would bring such a rebuke were in our four human reasons woven into this passage. And there is also four predictions. All eight of these are exceedingly bleak. First, because they were guilty of hoarding their riches. He rebukes them. They were guilty of hoarding their riches. Look at verse 2. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted. In those days, and much the same today, there were three ways a person would display their wealth. First, through food, having plenty to eat in abundance. Second, through garments, clothing. And third, through precious elements, the coin of the day, the money. Those who were wealthy ate well, they dressed well, they spent lavishly. But you notice that James, when when he talks about the three signs of wealth, adds the elements of the time and disuse. This is interesting stuff. If time and disuse are added to something, it will bring about rotting, moth-eaten, and rusting problems. That's what he's saying. In other words, you are hanging on to all that you have, and in hoarding it, it is rotting in your hands. That's the picture. Isn't it true that when we keep, then we rot? When we give, there's a fresh refreshing stream of God's blessing. These people did very little of giving. They kept. And James says, your food is rotten, your garments are filled with holes, and your gold and silver is rusted. Now, we all know that gold and silver doesn't rust. They tarnish. But James' picture here is that he wants to convey the vivid reality of time and disuse, just as useless as a rusty coin. They were hoarding rather than sharing. Look at verse 4. They were guilty of cheating others. That, that's another reason. He says they should shriek. Verse 4, Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. They had cheated those deserving of a wage, those who worked in in the independent areas, those who had a business have, have told me from, some, from time to time how difficult it is to separate the rich from their money when it comes to paying their bills. It is of interest when one of the signs of a selfish, rich person is the resistance to paying his bills. That is not a new problem. It is as old as the letter of James. They were cheating those that deserved a living wage. 
Maybe that has been your experience as you have worked with the wealthy. It may be that uh, they have withheld the wages that were due you. There is a third reason for this rebuke. It is in verse 5. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. That's a very, very vivid picture. It's a picture of, if I kind of maybe coin it, this word of the playboy lifestyle of our day. Hugh Hefner did not begin it, you know, by the way. You know, it, it goes as far back as selfishness. Man, given enough time, enough money, enough privacy, will turn it all toward himself. Now, that's the lifestyle mentioned here. Eat, drink, be merry, get fat. James adds, be slaughtered. Maybe you have been around livestock more than me. Those that have, I've heard that if you want to get a pig ready for slaughter, you put him in a pen and you just dump a bunch of food in there, and he will just gobble it up every day. He's just get eating himself right into the slaughterhouse. He just adds and adds and adds and adds, and then one day, the final blow, and life is over. And I, I wonder if James has that kind of thing in mind here. He surely had this in mind. I haven't been there, but I'm told by travelers to Rome, and maybe some of you have been there, that there is an interesting place near the Colosseum called the Palace of Nero. I heard that in this palace, there is an area where he dined sumptuously and with his close friends. And in the middle of this dining area, there was a, a hole. And it looks like the top of a well. And it's open. And there is space in the middle of this round area. And I also heard that it is at this particular table that he would eat his meals in gorge to the place of nausea. And they would run to this well and they would vomit up. All, all this excess food, and then they would go back to the table and gorge and gorge some more. It, yeah, that's a pretty outrageous picture. Uh, it actually makes me sick to read about it, <laughs> to talk about it. You know, it's like, it's, I would say it's stupid. But I guess not if you're totally selfish. If you were given to a pig life, Acting like a pig is not all that surprising. You know, that's, that's the kind of person James is addressing, someone who is totally selfish. And then there's a fourth reason for the guilt. Taking advantage of the righteous. Verse 6. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man, and he does not resist you. You see, because... They controlled the courts because the lawyers were pawns in their hands. All they had to do is pass the word, and the righteous men and women were put away. Now, some would teach that the righteous man is in reference to the Lord Jesus. I think he would, he would uh, probably be included. Others say that it is in reference to Stephen, the first martyr. I, I would include him also. But, but I think it's wise to include all the righteous of that day that have been you know, treated unfairly by, by wealthy and by the unbeliever. So, four reasons for the rebuke. One, they had hoarded their possessions 
They had cheated others. They had lived a life that was totally selfish. And they had treated an unfair way the righteous ones. Where was God in all this? Well, before I answer that question, I want to say there are some people here today who have very likely been treated unfairly, and in some cases, unfairly by the rich. And if you are not careful, you will develop a bitterness and an unforgiving spirit, and that has no room for God's intervention. Intervention. Now, I am pleased to say that the passage is not through. And when we have gone through these for reasons for rebuke, we are now going to go back. And we're going to go through them. And notice that this woven through the same fabric are the words that are for direct words of retribution. Let's notice them together. Look at verse 1 and once again. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Now down to verse 3. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and the rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of God. This is going into an area of a man or a woman's life that man cannot see with his human eye. It is saying, hoarded riches reap miserable dividends. That's the first word of retribution. Hoarded riches reap miserable dividends. Look into the face of a wealthy person. Study the lines in, the, in that face. And you, are, you often see the hollows in the eyes, the marks of time, of misery spread across that face. James is saying, not so much that the miseries will be coming, but the miseries are coming. He's saying that riches do not suffice in the day of wrath. Look again at verse 3. The second factor is that riches do not provide relief in eternity. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasures. Will you hold your place here? I, I want to go back to a verse in Proverbs. Look at chapter 11, chapter 11 in Proverbs, and go down to verse 4, verse 4 in Proverbs 11. I would like you to circle, put a circle around that verse 4, if you will, or at least put in the margin on James, write in Proverbs 11, 4. This was written by a man who was rich. He says, riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Righteousness delivers from death. Study those words. This is a proverb of contrast. It's saying the very same thing that James said. And when it comes to the final day, when it refers to as the day of wrath, Riches have no profit. Righteousness, however, delivers from death. There is something that comes to our rescue when death comes, and that is righteousness. Not your righteousness, but the righteousness that Christ credits to your account when you believe in him. Righteousness in Christ profits from death when death comes. You see, the greatest of all equalizers is death. At that moment, all men are horizontal. 
Have you ever heard of this expression? Man comes into life with a tight little fist. When he leaves, his hand is open. We carry nothing with us when we leave this earth. Nothing. Solomon says, won't you set your eyes upon heavenly things? Riches make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Maybe the last five years of, your, of our life should remind us of that. So, some of you were very blessed with this world's goods. And today your lifestyle is very different. Your bank account doesn't look like it belongs to the same person. Well, why? Because riches fly away as eagle towards heaven. You think that's bad? You, you should deal with the rich man who, he, when eternity dawns, he has nothing. Everything he has, he's held on to. He's released. And God never once says, let me see your account. Never once. God, God looks into the heart. Down where the where the surgeon cannot touch, down to into the spirit of man, and he looks for righteousness in Christ. And when he does not find it, that man is condemned. It's a bleak picture. And it really doesn't get any better when you turn to the third factor in verse 4, James 5. The outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. The Lord remembers the unjust acts of the unsaved. That's what this verse is saying. The outcry comes to the ears of the Lord. He doesn't forget that. And into that book of remembrance is placed that act that is unjust, and it is held against him. You see, in time, God wills grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. And the wealthy that gets away with all the sorts of blessings and benefits, able to dodge this and that, in the final analysis... He dodges nothing. You see, that's why James speaks with such forthrightness. Now, implied in all the, all the way through this is the fourth factor. A lack of judgment today does not mean a lack of judgment tomorrow. You know, when... You stop and think about it. The believer has his judgment behind him. The unbeliever has his judgment ahead of him. When Christ died, he carried the judgment that we should have carried. The unbeliever lives and dies rejecting the truth. He faces judgment. Jesus Christ came to carry it, but he rejected it. I don't think there is any sadder picture in all of the New Testament than the picture that Jesus gives us when he compares the beggar named Lazarus with a rich man who was not named. The beggar is filled with sores, and he sits at the rich man's front door just looking for crumbs from the table. And the rich man passes back and forth and never even gives him the time of day. Death comes, and an angel came and took a believing Lazarus and took him to the bosom of Abraham, which is the biblical reference for heaven. And there he finds security, delight, and love. 
The rich man dies. He finds himself in torment. He's in hell. Because he's rich? No. Because he's unbelieving. Because his riches have him. Because he is possessed by his possessions. And he longed for relief. You know, some time ago I read an article that appeared in the paper. A traffic officer gave a citation to a woman in Brooklyn. The particular offense was not mentioned in this column, but he gave her the citation and he handed it to her through the window. And she quickly just snatched it out of his hands and said, you can go straight to hell. Well, the, the officer took her to court. They, it, they appeared before the judge, and in a few days, the judge dismissed the officer's complaint about the woman's language. The judge said, and I quote, it wasn't a wish or a command, for going to hell is a possibility. You see, to put it very bluntly, you too can go to hell. But you need not go. That's the whole point. You can if you choose, but you don't need to. Jesus Christ has come to our rescue. You need not, but you can. Now, the sixth chapter of 1 Timothy provides all we need for ammunition for a couple of very practical lessons for us to remember today. I turn to it because it, addre it is addressed to the church and because it brings into good balance what this passage in James has been saying. It could be easily misunderstood, especially if you are wealthy and if you're an unbeliever. The first lesson is in verse 8, 9, and 10 of chapter 6. The first lesson is this. God's concern is not with actual wealth, but attitude toward wealth. It is your attitude toward wealth that is very significant. You can be a pauper under the judgment of God because of your attitude toward wealth. Let's, let's look at that. Verse 8. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Maybe we should change that word shall to should. We should be content. How, how very few people are content with a covering over their head and with sufficient food. Verse 9 goes, but, then he says to those who want to get rich, not, not, not to the rich, but those who long to be rich, Rich, there's the, there's the attitude. I'd ask you to raise your hands if you bought a lottery ticket, but I don't want to embarrass anybody, <laughs> including myself. You know, longing to be rich, that, that is some of you, I'm sure. You, you have a great longing desire to be rich, and, and you fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. We've all seen that happen. As it's been said, nothing ruins a person like success. How very few can handle it. If it takes intelligence to make it, it takes wisdom to live with it. And God knows not many of us could live with it. That's why he puts us where we're at. Verse 10, 
For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Not money. Don't misquote that. The love for money. Some of you have, have money and, and that dollar sign constantly in front of your face. And you can't act by faith because of your love for money. You can't act by faith because of your love and because of the constant concern, which is, is where I, you know, I want to get more, you know. How, how will I hang on to what I've got? What will I do with it later on? And that longing for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And I might add, it will shortcut so many marvelous steps of faith that you will never, ever take. How much would you give if you had no tax benefit provided you by the government? Stop and think about it. How many of your riches would you have released by now with no thought of ever receiving back something in return? That's a searching question. You know, how much of your giving is undercover with nobody knowing it just because of the delight to give? You see, the selfishness of man won't release it that way. He always wants to know, how can I, how can I get something back? Look at verse 17. Instruct those who are rich. Now, if you are gifted financially, here's some instruction for you. You are rich in this present world there are two dangers you are to look out for. One, do not be conceited. That's pride. Number two, don't find security in your dollars, fixing their hope on the uncertainty of riches. Well, in place of that negative warning, what can we say that is positive? There are three things to take the place of those two warnings. First, fix your hope on God. That's your attitude. Who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Be good, that is, be rich in good works. That's verse 18. And be generous and ready to share. The second word of warning or lesson is that God's counsel is not against people who are wealthy, but wrong priorities of the wealthy. In 1948, the ten man who had met 25 years before at the Edgewater Beach Hotel, came to the surface, and docu the documented evidence is as follows. The president of the steel company had died bankrupt. He had been living for five years on borrowed money, and he died without a dime of his own. The president of the National City Bank was still alive and retired a lonely life of a recluse. The president of a utility company died a fugitive from justice, a penniless beggar in a foreign country. The president of the largest gas company in the world was hospitalized insane. 
The president of the New York Stock Exchange had recently been released from prison. The member of the president's cabinet was pardoned and released from prison so that he could die at home with his family. The wheat speculator had died of suicide. The leader on Wall Street died of suicide. The head of land and industry died of suicide. The president of the Bank of International Settlements had died of suicide. Would you bow your heads with me? There is no automatic switch that I, I can reach in, you know, and, and turn in your heart to bring, bring about change. You know, what, what you are doing now, not, not with your money, but with your soul. Has there ever come a time in your life where you have become rich within? Forget about all your outer riches. They don't amount to hill beans when, when you draw your last breath. Riches don't profit in the day of death. If there has ever been a time when you have asked Jesus Christ, God's rich giver of salvation, to, be, to come into your heart, now is the time. Right now. Don't dodge this issue. Some of you have, have heard this offer of eternal life before but you never acted upon it. And, and I'm speaking to some of you this, this morning who are small people that, that, is, that is rich in this world's goods only. What a small way to live. Some of you are benevolent people. You, you've, you've got it. You give. But you have never given your heart to Jesus Christ. Some of you are good, good church-going, family-loving, bill-paying citizens. But Jesus Christ has never come into your life because you have never invited him in. Will you do that right now, right where you are sitting? God so loved the world, that's, that's Bethlehem, yeah. That, that he gave his only begotten son, that's Calvary. That whoever believes in him, that, that salvation, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's right now. If you have never received Christ right now, say, Lord, I receive your gift of Jesus Christ. I, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I need hope. I need forgiveness. Say that right now.